Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host, Seishu, and I'm with Dylan Patrick, a photographer now based in Los Angeles. He is, <laughs> he's a, a headshot photographer, and he's also involved in architectural work as well. I want to introduce you to him because I took a, a day-long workshop with Dylan in New York City just a couple of weeks ago, and it blew my mind. I really enjoyed myself so much that I said I had to get Dylan on my show. So thanks for <laughs> joining me today, man. I really Absolutely, appreciate it. man. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the one of the biggest questions uh, most people would have is how do you distinguish between a good headshot versus a bad headshot? Talk to us a little bit about that. For me, it uh, it's all about expression. I think uh, we, as photographers, photography is kind of one of those genres that's a little bit like filmmaking in the sense that it, uh, it requires a very technical skill set, but also requires a very artistic skill set. And I think sometimes in the photography world, we tend to get hung up on the technical aspect of things. We tend to get, and rightfully so, I mean, obviously we have to know how to use the light. We have to know what light does. Um, but at the same time, I think once you kind of get that down, the focus should really be on, especially if you're photographing, more importantly, if you're photographing people, the, the, the focus should really be on learning who people are, really learning how to connect with them, um, learning how to go through the images that you take of them and culling through and finding the best expressions. Because for me, headshot and portrait work in general uh, is all about expression. Um, if there's not something there then it, it, for me the image is is trashed even for my own work I go through my own work with an extremely uh, uh, diligent process to narrow down you know which one I want to use for my portfolio and I think sometimes especially in in social networking worlds we all get really caught up in hey look at this great shoot I did look at how beautiful the light is I'm gonna throw up some work on Facebook and and you know get some feedback and it feels, you know, like a lot of people can tend to go off a little half cocked. It's like, okay, you know, take a few days, go through and really, you know, challenge your mind when you're looking through, especially with headshots, because the focus is so much on the face mm -hmm. that if you're, if you're just looking at all the technical aspects of the photograph and you're not focusing on the expression first, then you're going to end up displaying work that, that may not be the best because you know, you might display one image for critique amongst your peers, but uh, that expression might be garbage, but you probably have other expressions in the shoot that are great. You just have to find them. Um, and, and obviously, the more you do it, the more expressions you're going to nail. Um, I, you know, I go through a headshot session in an hour, hour and a half, and, and I don't get 200 great expressions nobody does um but you got to learn to find those ones and and i think sometimes uh you know really developing a story for the people that you're photographing is such a big part of of what can challenge you to look at photographs differently um T talk to me about that because uh, i know you brought it up during the workshop and i was like i, I was first taken aback and then i was like oh that's a great idea you know yeah it's, so tell it's, us a little bit about that it's an abstract um, concept. I, you know, a lot of I, it's not really abstract. I mean, a lot of photographers, I think, understand it to a point. I just don't know that we really exercise uh, honing that skill set. And and so what I'm talking about basically is, if you go to, you know, leave the camera at home, go to a park, uh, go to a bar, go to a restaurant, um, and just really observe people and see what the real emotions are when somebody laughs, when somebody's crying, when somebody's clearly at a bar upset and start developing characters for these people. You know, if you see a guy at the end of the bar and uh, he's, he's 65 years old, he's kind of hunched over, he's got, you know, one Budweiser and he's got this face that's timeless. You know, as a photographer, you're looking at it and you're going, oh, this is, this would be a great face to photograph. But what's his backstory? Maybe he just lost his job at Con Ed after 30 years, and, and now he's sitting at the bar. You know, what, uh, does he have any kids? Um, and, and you can generate these, these storylines, um, and they don't have to be accurate. It's just about training your brain to look at a human being and relate it to a story. And I think that that can really help, uh, look, help you look at your images and go, okay, well, who is this person? Um, because in, in the headshot world, especially in the, you know, the 
the acting you know world of headshots you can have a lot of actors use one or two images every day so they've got their great you know hey smiling mm -hmm. shot and then they've That's got right. their serious shot um, but then they've also, you know, throughout the session, you're going to end up finding little character shots, ones where they might look a little more angry or they might look a little more um, edgy or, you know, it's not going to work every day, but who is that character? And educating your clients to look for that as much as a photographer looks for that, I think, can really start elevating your headshot game. Awesome. You've come up with a, a tutorial that's on oh. F-Stoppers called the Cinematic Headshot. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about why you called it the cinematic headshot, not just a regular headshot. Yeah, I've gotten a, a little bit of flack for that just because somebody, you know, decided I was redefining the genre of photography or something. Um, you know, for me, the, the term cinematic really started from my clients. Um, so I would go to consultations with my clients and they'd say, oh, I just, I really love your work. It looks like a film still. And I was like, that's awesome. That's exactly what I was trying to go for. My, uh, I grew up watching a lot of movies. I studied acting for film. That's the original reason why I moved to New York in, in 2004 um, and spent 10 years there working, you know, as an actor for a little bit, as a bartender and then trying to figure out and then photography. But so the cinematic style really came from really looking at close up work in movies. So in, in cinema, a headshot frame is typically going to be a uh, medium close up or an extreme close up. Extreme close up tends to be right below the chin, which is too close. Um, so about a mid close up shot somewhere just below the shoulders. And most of the time, um, actors are lit while they're outside. So, you know, film crews have these, you know, huge lights coming in from one side or the other. They're usually lit in two or three points, you know, from the back and, you know, a key light, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of stumbled upon it up on my roof. I, I started shooting headshots indoors against like a white sheet. It was terrible. I was, you know, trying <laughs> to be somebody I wasn't. And right. I, I really kind of just discovered that I hated shooting inside. It just, you know, it felt boring to me. So um, I wanted to give headshots a little more context. And I liked what a lot of natural light shooters were doing in New York um, outdoors. There's some really beautiful work by uh, Jordan Matter and Chris Mackey do some really beautiful uh, natural light work. But I wanted to add another dimension to that. And what I hadn't seen in New York or L.A. really um, was the mixture of studio style lighting outdoors in the headshot world. Now, clearly in the portrait world, stuff like this has been going on a long time. Um, certainly I didn't, you know, create anything new. I think it's just a particular style in the headshot world that wasn't really uh, there um, prior to what I was doing. And it kind of, you know, took off like a rocket. A lot of my yeah. um, friends, you know, a lot of headshot, a lot of things in the headshot world, in photography world in general, the marketing from it uh, is very word of mouth. And so my clients were leaving happy. They were going, look at these, you know, really different, amazing shots. And uh, that's kind of where the cinematic thing came from. And then, you know, when it was time, time to uh, name the tutorial, you know, we went through a ton of different names. Um, and we just kind of decided that the cinematic headshot fit the, the feel of what it is. And, uh, you know, a lot of, some people have said, ah, oh, you know, none of these shots look cinematic and it's like, well, you know, pay a little more attention to movies and close up work in the film. You'll see it all over the place. So, um, I, you know, just kind of took from there, I guess. You know, it's funny. Right after I came back from New York and I watched a, a movie, a George Clooney movie, um, <laughs> I believe it was, uh, uh, good night and good luck. Um, yeah. It was a story about Ed Murray, and I, I watched that movie so intently because it's all black. It's all in black and white, by the way. Right. And and, and there's lots of extreme close-ups, just like you were, mm -hmm. you were talking yeah. about. And you know, I, I watched where the lights were positioned, and you, know, you talked about lights behind the actors and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's spot on because you know, and it's and it's a great way to really. Uh, I think educate yourself by watching these movies and, and yeah. saying where would the light be, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So that's that's a great, great tip from you. Um, this is available on the F-Stoppers website. This tutorial is available on the F-Stoppers website. Um, and you also offer, as I've already indicated, uh, workshops. You've got a yeah. workshop. You, you had a workshop just a couple of weeks ago and you're coming back to New York, I believe, uh, next May. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so the plan is, um, 
you know, the workshop side of things, uh, I think would, you know, a lot of people learn best by doing. I know I'm one of those people. Absolutely. Um, and so the, the workshop you attended was actually my first time ever teaching a workshop, period. You could have fooled and, me. <laughs> thank you. Thank it, you. It, 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 went, um, it ran so well. And, and thanks to your wife as well. I think she, she organized it very oh, well. She rocks. Well. Yeah. Uh, it, it was such a really smooth operation. Seriously. You know, I, <laughs> I just thought, wow, I couldn't Good, believe it. Because I was terrified. Were right? <laughs> oh, you really? Well. Oh, yeah. I mean, first thing in the morning, you know, I, I think it's good to be nervous. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, I still get nervous before headshot sessions, and I've shot hundreds of them. So right. um, I think it kind of keeps you on your toes a little bit. But, yeah, I, I'm excited to see where the workshop thing can go. Um, that was the first one. Uh, right now I'm trying to kind of formulate plans for one here on the West Coast somewhere. Uh, you know, and then, yes, we'll be coming back to New York Sometime in May, we're looking at the early, the mid to early part of May, awesome. um, but it could be mid to late May as well. Uh, I went up in a helicopter the last time I was there, and then I discovered that Manhattan Henge happens later in May, so we might come later so I can do another helicopter ride and, oh, and yeah. catch Manhattan Henge from the air, but side story. Awesome, um, awesome. that's great. Yeah. Well, I, I look forward to your visit back to the East Coast. I know uh, it's your second home. Um, yeah, it was, and I, it's always a it's always a pleasure to meet, um, you know, instructors like you, photographers like you on a on a on a, on a whim. I'd come back down to uh, New York just to hang out and, to see what you guys are up to. Um, if there is a, another tip that you can give photographers, uh, especially something that you may have mentioned in your workshop that sure. would would help uh, my audience understand why headshots are so important. Uh, yeah. You know, and and you made interestingly, you made sure that every one of the participants had headshots too. Which <laughs> I, I initially I was like, wow, that's kind of weird, man. But you know, <laughs> it, it made sense. It made sense I, because now I know exactly how my clients feel about exactly. being photographed. Uh, and the other thing is, I got some amazing pictures of myself now. You know, thanks to oh, you. Good. So I liked it. Oh, uh, absolutely. Love yeah, it. This guy, this guy photographs great. I mean, what do you do? So I, I think, uh, you know, for me, uh, we, you know, part of what I felt like is it was important in teaching a workshop was saying, you know, look, you as a photographer need to understand what you're saying to a model and how it, how it affects them. You have to understand what it's like to be on front of the camera in a headshot frame because it's a tight working environment. You know, they can't move very much. Um, everything's pretty, you know, subtle movements. And you'll start to feel what the winning posture looks like or what the winning body language works like. I talk a lot about um, the simplicity of coaching physicality over emotions. So, uh, a, a lot of times in my workshops, I tell people, you know, or, you know, even my clients, I tell them, look, I'm never going to tell you what to think or what to feel. I don't want you up in your head trying to imagine you at the end of the bar hitting on some girl or whatever it is. I want you to just be present and focused. And I think uh, focus and, and being grounded in who you are as a person and, and embracing that is a big part of what makes a, a, headshot sex, a headshot session successful for a photographer or for the client. Um, the photographer equally needs to be grounded and, and confident in who they are and work with confidence, even if you're terrified inside. You have to project that grounded neutral place where the client can look at you and say, okay, he knows what he's doing. I'm going to be focused. Right. Um, and then coaching physicality is another huge element. It's as simple as, you know, me having a conversation with you like this and me having a conversation with you like that. Everybody just kind of went, whoa, on the screen. You know, it's like, that's, that's kind of the thing. The camera feels Absolutely. body language just as a human feels body language. So, um, you know, a lot of my coaching is very physical and just getting the client to, to really engage the camera on a physical level. And that will translate to an emotional level. Um, and then just finding those moments, you know, right. Uh, I, I don't know. The, the, even the the last ten minutes, I, it, it feels like I got a refresher from your <laughs> workshop. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is this is important important uh, information for photographers and uh, especially if photographers who are starting out, who are thinking or considering 
okay. headshots as a, as a way to get into the business. Um, yeah. You know, to do it right, you really, you don't have a to have a ton of equipment. We talked about we talked about that as well. Uh, yeah. You know, the equipment was sparse. I mean, we you use good equipment, but right. it, w- it wasn't like you were bringing in like five or six or seven lights <laughs> to light up a, no. a, a head headshot. No. You know, like it was just simply, you know, a, I'm a, yeah, yeah I'm it's a two very, lights, two lights and a reflector, pretty much. Yeah, right? I, I nine ninety nine percent of the time I use two speed lights, a reflector, and uh, that's it. You know. Um, you know, obviously, I, I use an Okta and a, and a softbox, which you can kind of see from the tutorial and, a, you know, various other areas I talk about it. But um, for the most part, I wanted to create a style of headshot that I could do, that I could replicate anywhere. Um, so the idea was that I can make the headshot look, the headshot style that I do, I can make anywhere. I can make it in a hotel lobby. I can make it down on a street corner. Um, and it's very portable, you know, yeah, it's more to set up than working with just natural light. Um, but I think the dynamic result you get, that's just separates it from natural light. It doesn't mean that it's better. Like I said, I love a lot of natural light, uh, shooters, but I think, you know, bringing another element to it gives it that extra little bit of pop. That's just a little bit different than, than what, uh, everybody else might be doing because you can kind of control that light on the face and, and do some really interesting stuff. And, and I think, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting started headshots, you know, look, I work with a lot of actors, but there's, you know, match.com, Tinder, uh, corporate headshots, um, real estate agents, you know, it, there's so many different applications for it and it's becoming so much more important, uh, now than it ever used to, especially with things like LinkedIn and social media and, and developing a, you know, people are more and more interested in developing a brand, developing a presence, and then, you know, finding the market and the, you know, price point that you can price yourself at to make it worth your time. But then, you know, I, I offer really, really short, you know, 15 minute sessions for social media that are affordable, you know, for people. So you got to, you know, I get a lot of questions about pricing and how to price this and how to price that. And, you know, I think they really just have to look at the market around you and, and come in somewhere around that. You got to look at what people do to make a living in your area. Right. Right. Absolutely. And sort it out from there. Cool. Uh, if you don't mind uh, talking a little bit more about the gear, uh, I know sure. when we were at the workshop, the the sort of almost uh, pivotal piece of gear that made it all happen for you, for us, really was the Pocket Wizard uh, mm-hmm. TT5 and I, AC3s. Yeah. Uh, you know, without that, I, I feel like we might be hamstrung in trying to get anything done. Uh, yeah. To so talk a little bit, Bri, uh, and so, you know about the whole s- s- setup. Yeah, absolutely. So it, part of part of the the cinematic style comes from harnessing high speed sync. Um, so I, I'm somebody who doesn't like neutral density filters when I'm doing headshot sessions. This look, my look, can be. Uh, achieved using neutral density filters but you'll end up finding that it gets in the way of seeing the expression if the if the expression is the most important thing i don't want you know a bunch of layers right. in between me and the model trying to point. you know me trying to read her expression now some people could do it you know whatever works for you at the end of the day but um utilizing high speed sync is very freeing so i use uh two pocket wizard flex tt5s um, two Nikon, an SB900 and SB700. And on the camera that triggers it all is the Mini TT1 with uh, the AC3 zone controller attached to the top. And so what that allows me to do is independently control the flash power between the key light and the kicker light. Um, so I can adjust its power as necessary. And when I'm getting into really, you know, high shutter speeds, like, you know, my typical kind of where I, where I, my sweet spot, if I could pick one is, is F3.2 at 1250 of a second tends to be, uh, where I find a lot of really great color, um, and it just hits every, every, you know, a bunch of my shots are shot at that and they just come out, you know, fantastic. So but that kind of flexibility allows me to say, oh, maybe I want a brighter shot. So I'm going to drop the shutter speed down to, 
you know, one eight hundredth of a second, and then I can independently adjust the power on the flashes, so I'm not bouncing around from one light to the other light. Now, um, I'm a huge fan of Pocket Wizards. They, you know, there are cheaper options, absolutely, and I understand people needing to be on a budget. I mean, I was, um, you know, when I first started too. So you got to kind of pick and choose your battles. The Pocket Wizard system is a very, I found it to be extremely reliable. I've shot it, uh, you know, on rooftops in New York City surrounded by cell towers. Um, I've shot it on the streets. I've shot it on the beach. Everything always just works for me. Um, there are situations where it has become, you know, I get little technical problems. I think we even had a couple at the at the workshop where we had to kind of power things off and power them back on again. But, you know, technology is not perfect. It is what it is. Um, they recycle faster, too. I, I do own a Young and O system that is also very affordable, and it works great. I don't feel like it can keep up with me, you know, on the on the recycle refresh time. And, they, and I don't know it's necessarily the, the Young and O speed lights as it is, the trigger system. I don't know if it communicates fast enough. So gotcha. um, if, you know, you're starting slow, you can obviously pace out your session to kind of work with it. And that's not a big deal either. Sometimes I think we try and get into a session and we shoot too fast. It's like, you know, just pop off 10 or 20 shots, sit down, review, talk with your model for a minute, pop off another 20 more, really connect with them. And instead of just, you know, guns blazing through right. the whole thing. Right. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, for, for modifiers, I've been using the 39-inch uh, uh, deep octa from Ellen Chrome, um, and I also use a 36-octa uh, hot rod octa from Last Light, and I love both products. I just found that the, the Ellen Chrome is a little deeper, a little bigger, so it's going to give me a little punchier but softer light, and... Uh, Give me a little more flexibility too. As it's a couple inches bigger, I can keep it back a little bit. Um, and then for the backlight, I just use a Last Light 24 by 24 Easy Box. Um, simple, easy. All of them are really light. Fold down really small. Easy to take somewhere. Um, Sweet. And and that's it. 30 awesome. inch reflector underneath. There and you go. Oh, you're good to go. Absolutely. Yeah. I I was amazed at how simple and and effective the the equipment w was when you set up and you'd set up two bays and there was a you know the models were incredible to work with uh at the workshop yeah. really really nice people well and b and h was awesome they they B &H, loaned us all that yeah, canning yeah. gear so right. yeah, they, they um, came through get, as well gotta yeah. give b and h props because that's that's the first time i've ever been able to borrow anything from b and h before so <laughs> that's um, that was that was great very nice of them to support it so awesome um when uh, so you're going to be back next May, and I hope I can I can definitely meet you again when you come back into the city. Absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, one thing I should mention is anybody who who buys the the cinematic headshot from F Stoppers, uh, you actually add them to your forum or Facebook mm -hmm. forum, right? And, yeah, and they become a part of your family pretty much, where yeah. you you coach them through certain issues they may be having or whatever. And uh, interestingly, uh, there there are already a few people in there who are just phenomenal at yeah. what they do you know yeah. and yeah. it's it's no surprise i mean they've got a great teacher but the fact is oh, they, they've listened to what your advice and they've taken it in a different direction as well mm -hmm. which i think is what like it should be you know yeah you, yeah absolutely uh, hopefully people aren't just there to just copy you sure and and, and sort of present that as their own work but i I would be, you know, I, I see both sides of that coin. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, on one hand, I'm, I'm extremely flattered and very honored that, that people have really taken to this to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, when we first filmed it, we were kind of like, I don't know, you know, Peter Hurley's got a great one out there. I don't even know if this is going to, and he does. Yeah, yeah. I love, I love Peter's work. Um, this is just kind of offering a different thing, different approach. And, you know, we weren't sure how well it was going to do. And it's, it's really been humbling, I think, in a lot of ways for me personally to, to, to receive these kind of questions. But, yeah, once, uh, once you purchase the tutorial, there's a link in there after you purchase that you can join the, face, the Facebook community or the Facebook group, I should say. And we got a lot of great people there. I'm very active there, more so than any other group I'm in. Um, you know, I go on kind of, you know, week or two week hiatuses at, at points, but for the most part, I'm very accessible. And I think that's really important with a product like this. I don't, you know, I think it's hard to just say, ah, here's a, here's a lesson, you know, take it and apply it and then not be accessible after that. Right. Now, um, at a certain point it, it, 
can become exhausting to be that accessible. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, I try and get to everybody's questions and, and really uh, help them kind of find their own way through this because everybody's going to have a different take on it. That's kind of the beauty of the artistic nature of, of photography and filmmaking and painting or whatever it is. But, um, yeah, they, they joined this Facebook group. There's some people in there that are, are really taking off with it. Whoops. <laughs> really taking off with it and doing, uh, doing great stuff with it. So there's, there's a really good community in there and I've got a really, um, strong stance on, trolls and constructive criticism and so i we've kind of set a good critique tone in there which i think is really important because a lot of times critiques as we all know in the photography community can turn into this like i don't like it the light's crap you know and it's like okay well you know let's let's put a little more thought into it yeah. and and if you're going to critique a photograph let's let's start with some things that you do like and some things that you don't like and give people you know a perspective and so i think that's been really beneficial to our group too we don't have uh, a lot of the drama that i've seen break out in some other facebook groups so awesome. um it's good good man thank you so much for joining uh yeah. me today i, I really enjoyed and really enjoyed speaking with you again uh, we've been talking with Dylan Patrick uh, from uh, the Cinematic Headshot. Uh, he's uh, involved in architectural work as well. But you know his 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 stick, I guess, right now is <laughs> you know the Headshot, which I love. Yeah. I absolutely love. And uh, you'll see some examples of of his work uh, and my work in the post below. So uh, check awesome. it out and check out the Cinematic Headshot at fstoppers.com. Thank you so much again, Dylan. Have a great day. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Bye. See ya.